<clears throat> All right. I will say good morning again. Go ahead and uh, make your ways to your seats. Let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for our morning together. Thank you for every single soul that is here. Thank you that every single one of us has the, has the desire to be here. The, the reason all of us are here is because we're looking to get something out of our time together with you. Thank you for that unified spirit that, that we have. And Lord, we ask that you would answer that request, that prayer, that Lord, we would receive something from you this morning. Every single one of us has something different on their mind. We're all in different circumstances, living different lives, doing our best to make the most of what you've given us. And Lord, we all have different needs. So we just pray, no, pray now, Lord, that you would reach into our hearts and help us to know and understand our plight, know and understand the depth of the, the mess that we are in here on planet Earth and in our own sin. And Lord, that you would, again, prove yourself to be true and loving, that the gospel would reach some in this room for the first time and for the rest of us, that it would reach us again for the thousandth time in deeper and more meaningful ways. God, we love you. We dedicate our time to you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, so as we have mentioned here, we are going to finish our series today. The series that we've been in is How Do I Know That I'm Saved? And over the last many weeks, we have covered um, all the different questions that we ask ourselves to know and understand. Do I have the Holy Spirit in me? Do I belong to Christ? Can I rest in that blessed assurance that... Um, I so desperately need and want on a daily basis. The series has gone really well. I've uh, gotten a lot of feedback from you guys, and I just hope and pray that this last, these last many messages end up being a tremendous resource for you when, when the devil attacks somehow, some way, that every time, you know, when the devil says, how dare you? How can you possibly say that a Christian can act like that? How can you say that a Christian should speak that way or think that way or feel that way. You must not be saved. When the devil does that to you, I just hope that you can go and just say right back to him, sorry, sir, but I have read and I know and I understand the book of 1 John and John desired, Jesus desired, God desired that I know and understand that I do indeed belong to him and I can go through these questions and these understandings out of the book of 1 John and know for certain that I do belong to Christ and not question whether or not my eternal destiny is with him or elsewhere. So let's go over those, the eight markers that we've gone over over these last many weeks. Here's the eight markers. One, do I penitently confess and repent of my sins? Do I forgive others the way that Christ has forgiven me? Do I love my fellow believers in a more affectionate way than I do with those in the rest of the world? Do I hate my sin? Do I make sure that I don't live a lifestyle of sin? Do I love the truth of God's commands? And do I hate the system of this world? We've covered all of those things. I hope and pray that that's been incredibly impactful for you and given you that blessed assurance. Today, our last one, and I've saved the, the best for last, really, my primary point this morning Jesus is the supreme and only treasure of a true Christian. Let me repeat that. Jesus is the supreme and only treasure of a true Christian. So this morning, the big question that we all have to ask is the final question that we're going to be asking ourselves from this series, and that is, is Jesus my treasure? So maybe you've noticed, because y'all are pretty quick on the uptake, usually, um, <laughs> I tend to end my sermons the same way. I don't know if you've caught that or not, uh, pretty much every single week, and I do this on purpose. I want to end my message with the gospel every single week, like 90% of the time or more, that is my goal. This is incredibly important to me 
because it is the most important message in the entire universe. There is nothing that will ever be more important than the gospel for eternity. So the gospel is what ends up, that's how we end our our messages, my messages for the most part. But I don't end it with, okay, well, let's just pray a prayer, right? I don't know if you've noticed that. Because to be a Christian, you don't just pray the prayer so that you can receive your fire insurance from hell. So I don't end my, my messages with pray and confess and you shall be saved. I end it with the most appropriate way that I know so that I can know that when you say yes to that, you mean it. I say, we want to welcome you to the family of God, put the resources in your hand to help you as you begin your journey with Jesus as your treasure. Yep, you guys are sharp. So yeah, this message this morning, is Jesus my treasure? This message is massively important. This message is one that is quite central to our culture here at New Life. It ought to be central to every church across the planet but it definitely is what we make priority, that Jesus is our treasure. And this, in many ways, is, I've I've saved the best for last, if you know what I mean by that. Because honestly, if Jesus is your treasure, then all of those other things that we've covered over the last many weeks will also be true. If Jesus is your treasure, then you will confess, you will repent, you will forgive, you will love your brothers hate your sin, maintain a lifestyle of righteousness to the best of your ability, you'll hate the world, you'll love the truth. So in many ways, this could be the only question that you have to ask and genuinely, honestly answer for yourself. Is Jesus my absolute treasure? When all the chips are down and I have to choose between Jesus and everything else, would I choose Jesus? And is that fact incredibly obvious to me? Do I know that with absolute certainty? So I saw something this week that just blew me away. (laughs) Blew me away. Oh my goodness. I was reading through the Lord's Prayer and I realized the Lord's Prayer has all of these attributes in it. I should have been saying this from the very first message on this. The Lord's Prayer has the attributes that we've been going over. over. Matthew 6, verses 9 through 15. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. You're my treasure. You're the Holy One. Everything else around here is nothing. You're the treasure. Your kingdom come. I don't like this kingdom. I hate the system of this world. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Why? Because I love the truth of your commands on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Once again, this world, nothing in this world is to be above you. Nothing. You must be supreme, my one and only treasure. Forgive us our debts. I confess and repent of my sin as we also have forgiven our debtors. I love and forgive others in the same way that you have for me. Lead us not into temptation. Why? Because I hate my sin. Deliver us from the evil one. I never want to live a lifestyle of this. Isn't this crazy? Just, whoa. The Lord's prayer is an identity prayer. And when these attributes are your identity, guess what you are? A Christian. Jesus is speaking. When somebody prays this genuinely, you can never question whether or not they belong to me. Okay, so... Let's go ahead and dive in here. Is Jesus my treasure? Our text this morning is twofold. We've got two primary texts this morning, and I bet already you know one of them, my favorite parable, which is the shortest parable that Jesus ever spoke, Luke 13, 44, which says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Obviously, duh, no brainer. That one's gonna be central to our message today. But yes, ladies and gentlemen, our series is out of 1 John. And of course, 
John is going to say all kinds of things about why we love God and why he should be our treasure. treasure. Just read the book of 1 John. It's littered with it. You can't go through practically a verse without seeing Jesus needs to be your treasure. But home base this morning is 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Okay? Before we read verses 9 and 10, though, I want to give you some context. I want you to think about this. What is our treasure? When we say that Jesus is our treasure, what exactly do we mean by that? What we mean by that is God's overwhelming love for us that he rescued us from our sin. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And how did he make us children of God? How did he lavish this love on us? By sending his own son to die in our place. That is our treasure. Our treasure is the lavish love of God. Okay, so now when we read about God's love, insert the word treasure here and you you, you can see, okay? 1 John 4, 9 and 10. This is how God's love, our treasure was revealed among us. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him and his love. Our treasure consists in this, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. That, ladies and gentlemen, is our treasure. Must be absolutely 100 million percent the center of your life. Point number one. Finding and obtaining the treasure is the moment of conversion. For most of us in this room, we have experienced what it is to find and obtain that treasure. And when we did that, that was our conversion. When you realize what Christ has done for you and he opens your eyes to its value, that is the moment that the Holy Spirit enters The moment that you have been converted, God's love has converted you because by some mystery, you understand the greatest news the universe has ever known and ever will know. The thing that was hidden has now been revealed. The thing that you've been trying to solve, your big problem in life with sin, it has been solved. That problem, that punishment is coming my way And I have to sit in fear for the rest of my life knowing that it's headed right for me is no longer coming to us because Christ took our punishment for us. That is the most joyful news in the universe for all of time. And guys, this didn't happen because we loved him. It happened because he loved us. It came to us. It was revealed to us because he loved us, not because we loved him. And he gave us the ability to love. When he converted us, he opened our eyes, and then we loved him. Every single one of us who has a clue as to our condition, I want to show you a prerequisite to understanding and seeing and apprehending the treasure. A prerequisite to that for everyone is this understanding of your condition, knowing that I deserve punishment. For every single one of us, those who see the treasure, what we saw before that was our need for the treasure. Everyone who is genuinely saved, it is because they recognize I am a mess. They feel their own shame from the sin that they commit, and then that shame produces this fear. And then to cover up the shame and fear, then we go out hunting for a treasure. That's what this man was doing in the parable. He was hunting for a treasure. Where might I find the treasure that fills this void? And when you fill your life with pointless, worthless things, it doesn't work. You realize it doesn't work until the treasure of God's grace is revealed to you. What is hidden is revealed. Every Christian prior to conversion understands one thing. I am not good enough to be in the presence of my own creator. 
I can illustrate this just by talking about gratitude. You're not good enough, and the only thing I got to talk about is gratitude. I don't have to talk about all of your sin. I can just say, are you grateful? (laughs) Because, think about this. Let's say that we're at the lake together, and I'm 20 yards away from my 10-year-old daughter, Selah. We hear a scream, and we look over and we see Selah is beginning to drown. I'm too far away. You swim as fast as you can. You rescue my daughter, Selah. You save her life. You bring her back to me, and then I say nothing to you. (laughs) How would you feel about that? Honestly, you just saved my daughter's life. I don't even say thank you. Just walk away. You know, every single person knows that ingratitude is a punishable offense. All I have to do is tell you, in order for you to be convinced that you're not good enough, is just to recognize that simple fact. And so, if God were to ask us these simple questions, we can know and understand we're not good enough. If God asked this question, question number one, do you see All the beauty in this world, all the gifts that I gave you, do you recognize even some of the gifts that I gave you? Question number two, do you understand the offense when others aren't grateful to you when you have done something kind for them? Question number three, do you feel that you have lived an adequate life of gratitude for all that you have received from me? And we all know the answer to that last question. Nope, I have not lived an adequate life of gratitude thanking you for all that I have received from you. If the answer is no, ladies and gentlemen, case closed. We're not good enough. We cannot be in the presence of a holy God. We know in our very conscience, just based on ingratitude alone, that every single human being, all of us, are without excuse. We know we are guilty and we deserve to be punished, and that is just for the lack of gratitude, let alone living the rest of our lives doing everything that we can to sacrifice for other things that are so completely worthless instead of trying to pursue our maker. All of us know that death is what we deserve and it's our fault. We can try to excuse our behavior and make it everyone else's fault or even God's fault. But at the end of the day, if we are honest, we have to take responsibility. We chose our mistakes. We chose our attitude. We chose the thoughts to dwell on and then we acted on them when we knew we shouldn't. So we're all in this terrible plight knowing that we deserve death. We see our sin, which produces all kinds of shame, and that shame produces a very appropriate fear. And then in our pride, we go and search, go on this treasure, treasure hunt, looking for anything that can possibly fill that void. And each time we fill it with something worthless, we feel more shame and more fear. All that comes flooding back in. But the prerequisite to finding the treasure is that you know you need to find it. It's like we're walking around, kicking the dirt, looking for this treasure, and we're just not finding it, wishing that we hadn't gotten ourselves into this mess when our toe trips over something. Something in all of our mess is revealed. Something we didn't see before, something we didn't understand before, and we find our treasure, our greatest treasure joy, the thing that will become everything for us and everything else is nothing. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, in his greatest joy, he sold all that he had and bought that field. When we find it, we buy it because God has converted us. Point number two. A true Christian will see the treasure for its infinite value and see everything else as worthless junk. This is a challenge for everybody in this room as pampered, 
coddled Americans? Do we see all of our stuff as worthless junk? When we found that treasure, this is how we responded. If you are a Christian and you find the treasure, that's the response. Joy, give up everything. This is infinite value. Everything else is nothing. At least that's how we should respond to it. We should see it for what it is, a treasure. And not just any treasure, but a treasure worth giving everything up for. Because honestly, guys, If you don't see it with that kind of beauty, then you just plain and simply don't see the treasure. You may see something nice. You may see something comforting, appealing, desirous, but you don't see a treasure. As you know, there's plenty of people that just add Jesus to their life. He's not their treasure. He's just their personal genie personal cuddle buddy who just, you know, like a puppy, goes back into the kennel when you need him to go away or when he gets in the way. As I've said around here, as we've said around here, often there is an epidemic of false faith, especially here in America. Churches are full of people that do not truly see Jesus as their treasure. No, Their money, their influence, their reputation, their toys, that's their treasure. And the moment that Jesus begins to mess with those things, it's not the money, the reputation, or toy that gets put in the kennel. It's Jesus that gets put in the the kennel. So very serious question for you. Is Jesus your treasure, supreme and only? Is is, Is he everything and everything else is second to him? Beyond that, is everything last compared to him? Is everything garbage compared to to him? Paul had some things to, to say about this. In Philippians 3, he said, if someone else thinks that they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law a Pharisee, as far as zeal, persecuting the church, as far as righteousness based on the law, I was faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss. Do you see this? Everything a loss. Not that things are good. Yeah, that's good. Not even that they're neutral. Paul's attitude is everything else only keeps me, hinders me from my treasure. All this other stuff is just a burden and weighs me down. Only Christ lightens my load because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. What? Do you have in your life that you don't consider garbage? What are things that you are valuing? Primary point, Jesus is the supreme and only treasure of a true Christian. When I say the only treasure of a true Christian, that's what Paul was getting at. In comparison to, in comparison to Christ, everything is garbage. All this other stuff, I don't even view it as something that I want I want Christ. Just give me Christ. There is no meaning in anything without Christ. It's so easy for us as Americans to to be Christians or to claim Christianity. It it might, maybe things are getting a little harder for us right now. And they might be about to, we might be on the verge of them getting far more difficult for us. But Seriously, what have you had to sacrifice in order to have Christ? Honestly, what have you had to sacrifice in order to obtain Christ? Have you, have you lost family? Have you lost friendships? Have you lost money? Have you lost your job? Have you lost your entire lifestyle? I mean, what have you seriously had to sacrifice? We as Christians... 
It's not difficult to be a Christian here. It's easy for us. We get promoted at work because we're a Christian. We're the ones that have principle and values and hard working. I don't want to say that John, Donald Trump is a, is a Christian. That's not what I'm saying. But he holds a Bible up to advertise that he's a Christian to his own benefit so that people will vote for him. It's not hard for us to be a Christian right now. I get it. I know. I understand. The media is going crazy on us and all that stuff. But it's nothing compared to what's going on in the rest of the world. We haven't been penalized for being a Christian. Maybe we've been razzed from time to time at work in, in the grand scheme of things. But we've gotten off really, really easy. Do you claim that you would follow Jesus wherever he would go? Is that what you claim? Because others have said that and fallen short. Others witnessed Christ himself, saw him do miracles, and said, yep, I'm ready to follow you, and fell short. Others have thought, yep, I'm ready, and they weren't. Are you better than them? Do you feel like you know and understand yourself better than they knew and understood themselves? And how are you certain about that? Like that's the reason we're preaching through this series, right? So you can be certain of this question. But we need to be very sober about it because here's what Jesus said, okay? In Luke 9, 57, came to pass as they went on the way, a certain man said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. This guy makes a bold statement. I am ready, Jesus. You tell me what to do, how to act, what to think, feel. I am on board. I am your man. And how does Jesus reply to this? He says, all right. Foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Dude, I'm homeless. You want to follow me? And the guy walks away. Jesus knew the guy wasn't ready. Jesus knew this guy was ready as long as he didn't have to give up his creature comforts. So Jesus tells him, if comfort is important to you, you're following the wrong guy. Do you realize that's what God, what Jesus would say to us? He would look us dead in the eye and say the same thing to every person in this room. If comfort is important to you, good sir, you do not see me who, for who I am. You don't understand who you're talking to. You don't have a clue who you are or who I am. So the next guy says, I want to follow you, but first I need to go bury my father. Now, my understanding of this text is not that this guy's dad had just died and he needs to go do a funeral. Jesus has a little more of a heart than that. You know, we see evidence of that with Mary and Martha. When Lazarus died, we understand that. So that's not what's going on here, I don't believe. In my opinion, I think what's happening here is he's saying, first, let me go bury my father because my father's really old and he's going to die sometime soon. And when that sometime soon happens, I'm going to get a big old fat inheritance. So let me just do that first and then I'll come and follow you. And what did Jesus say? He said, let the dead bury their dead. You come follow me and preach the kingdom. No deal. First guy wouldn't give up his comfort. Second guy wouldn't give up his money, his inheritance. And then another says this, I will follow you, but let me first go say goodbye to everyone at home in my house. And Jesus said, nobody putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. You cannot plow a straight furrow looking in the opposite direction. Hello, Lot and his wife from last week. So no, guy, no, no deal with this guy either. This guy couldn't give up his family. Maybe 5% of the people in this room have had to give up a family member. Maybe. But the rest of us know nothing of what that's like. It's noteworthy, ladies and gentlemen, that in all these cases, just let me ask you this question. Think about what I just said, what Jesus said to those three guys. You answer the question audibly to me, okay? <laughs> you tell me. Did Jesus make it easier or harder for them to follow him? That is noteworthy. 
Does he beg them to stay when they want to walk away? No. I'll be saying more about this next week, just planting the seed here uh, for, for next week. We should be, should be fun. We should not have a low standard for Christianity. Jesus didn't. And often we see the American church making the Christian life very easy so that they can feel really good about all their comforts. When the truth is, those people, where it's easy, they haven't found a treasure. They have found a comfort blanket for when their real treasures don't satisfy. But who among us has had to give up comfort, inheritance, or family to follow Jesus? Not many. And honestly, as your pastor, this is a concern of mine. I really want you guys to do some soul searching here because many of us, most of us, have not been tested. Not like this. Our friends in Nepal, they have. They know what it is like to give up everything to follow Jesus, and they do. They know what it's like to have their own family turn on them and persecute them because it's happening all the time. It is hard to question their faith when they just walked away from their entire family and are willing to go to jail to stand with Jesus. Guys, I I love you, and I have tremendous confidence in this amazing group of people as a whole, but I'm telling you, fan into flame your first love here because I know and understand that the world is full of treasures, and we get so distracted by it, and it's not garbage to us. We look at it like it's going to satisfy. I need you guys to be able to ask yourself these eight questions. It's very possible that very hard times are coming our way, and we need to be prepared for that. If Jesus is not your supreme and only treasure, then you will lose your footing. Point number three. Giving up everything to have Jesus, to have the treasure, is a joy, not a sacrifice. If we asked you to give up your job, your family, you would feel, oh, that's a sacrifice. When you truly understand who Jesus is, it's not a sacrifice, it's a joy. It's pretty easy for typical preachers out there to say, well, here's how you need to be saved. There's four things you need to do in order to be saved. One, you need to confess, then you repent, then you believe, confess, believe, repent, then baptism, right? They'll they'll say those four things are what are necessary in order to call yourself a Christian. You don't have to, and and then some will say, well, just pray the prayer. This little formula And you're in. You don't have to change. You don't have to live a certain way. Just say this formula and you can have eternal security. Guys, no one should have eternal security ever because they prayed a prayer. Praying a prayer does not even mean that they really believe or they really confess or they really repent. Yes, those things are all important. Don't don't take me as saying that those things need to take a back seat. But Jesus said a whole lot more than that. And I need us to recognize what Jesus said. There are many people that ask Jesus what's the the most important question in the world. They ask him, what must I do to be saved? And you know what? Guess what Jesus never said? (laughs) He never said, confess, repent, believe, or be baptized. He never said that. Not that those aren't implied. Like, I get that. He could imply that stuff. But here's what he said when people asked him that question. What our Savior said is, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You need to trust me like a two-year-old trusts their dad. Boy, that's a sacrifice, isn't it? Feels that way. In Mark 8, the condition is self-denial, the willingness to lose your earthly life for Christ. 
He says, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. In Matthew 10, Jesus says the condition is loving him more than anyone else. He says, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. If you love your son or daughter more than me, hello, parents, not worthy of me. And in Luke 14, the condition for salvation is that we are free from the love of our own possessions. Whoever does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. These are Jesus' words. Jesus' requirements for, for salvation feel a little more serious, don't they? Feel a little more serious. I want to be a Christ follower. Okay, pray a prayer. Jesus said a little more than that. These requirements that Jesus puts down here, it's not like you can check this off a box. You can't just check, yep, I prayed it. Check, check yep, I confessed it. You, you, you can't check this stuff off of a box. They are something more that you must always be and always do. Be like a child. Trust God like you're two. Love him more than family. Love him more than possessions and even your own life. This is what it means for Jesus to be your treasure. This is what it means to truly be converted because if you are truly converted, then you will do these things. Do you recognize this? Do human beings do this? <laughs> do human beings, adults, trust God naturally like they're two? Do they naturally not value their family more than God? Do they naturally give up all their possessions. No, human beings don't do this. This is something that God does when he converts you. When he gives you his Holy Spirit, he gives you this joy and this desire and you joyfully do these things. Human beings don't do this. Only God does this. And only where you find, where you find a human being doing what only God can do, there you find a Christian. Because it can feel like this stuff is a sacrifice. Trust God like a child, it's hard. Leave your family, that's hard. Love him more than possessions, comforts, or even your life, that's hard. But ladies and gentlemen, when God shows you the treasure, the treasure is so infinitely value, it be, valuable, it becomes a joy to make those sacrifices, and those sacrifices cease to be a sacrifice. That's why this is my favorite parable because it succinctly says what a person looks like when they have entered the kingdom of heaven. That they would quickly and in their joy give up everything to have Jesus. He is truly their supreme and only treasure. It is not a sacrifice for the Christian to make Jesus their supreme and only treasure. It is for our joy. Do you realize this? You don't need, it's so easy for us. We think we need to, you don't have to beg people to come to Christ. <laughs> if they see the value of the treasure, you won't be able to stop them from coming to him. It is indeed true that when a person truly perceives the grace of God, that grace of God is irresistible. When God decides to save you, there is nothing that a human being can do about that. You can't stop somebody from coming to God. God does it. And in their joy, that joy, it is a joy for them to run. That joy is unstoppable. Jesus said in John 15, 11, to his disciples talking about this joy and summing up the rest of what he had to offer the reason why he gave us the gospel, the reason why he died on the cross, the reason why he makes us his children is for our very joy. These things I've spoken to you have spoken that my joy might remain in you and your joy might be what? Full. And in 1 John, John says here in our book, the book that we've been in, a, very, a purpose statement of our book. He says this, these things I write unto you that your joy may be full. And then in John 16, the gospel of John, it seems like John likes joy. 
Our Lord says in verse 24, until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Everything is about the treasure of Christ. Everything flows to him, through him, from him. When that's the case, all of life is a joy. So maybe you're here this morning and you've been experiencing the waning of joy. <laughs> you, you hear me say, if God were to ask you to give up your possessions, your relationship, your lifestyle, then that's a joy. Like Paul said, all this other stuff is garbage anyway, and you're like, well, Ben, actually, I see that as a sacrifice way more than a joy. Okay. That's why I'm preaching this message, ladies and gentlemen. If you have been allowing yourself to get soft in your faith, fan into flame your first love. Stop looking here. Stop looking back. Stop playing Lot's wife. Look to God, run to him for your joy, not what you originally left in joy to belong to him. Or maybe you're here this morning and you have been experiencing that shame of your own mistakes. And there's only one treasure that can resolve that. Your sin has been forgiven by Christ himself, having died on the cross to take your punishment for you. If you're here this morning and that is the greatest news that you have ever heard and you're hearing it now for the first time, you're walking in that field looking for that treasure and your toe trips on something and the thing that was revealed is, the thing that was hidden is now revealed. You're trying to figure out how do I get out of this mess? And now you are ready in your joy to see everything else in life as refuse so that you can gain Christ. Well, if that's what you want, well, then there's nothing I can do to stop you. So I won't try. I'll simply invite you to please talk to me after the service, to, after the service or talk with the person who brought you this morning. I would love to welcome you to the family of God and put the resources in your hand to help you as you begin your journey with Jesus as your treasure. Why don't you go ahead and take a few minutes here this morning and write down some notes, pray, talk with the person next to you about what was most meaningful from today's message, and the band will close us here in a few minutes with a song.